Thank you very much. Thank you very much for inviting me here to speak. Um, I'm going to take a step back a little bit uh, and talk about effectively a, uh, a study or uh, talk about some of the findings of a study we've been undertaking at the London School of Economics uh, together with LSE Cities on the economics of green, resource-efficient, sustainable cities. It's a study chaired by Lord Stern. I worked with him on the Stern Review uh, on the economics of climate change. Uh, and we've got a, a number of partner cities already. We've got Copenhagen, we've got Portland, uh, we've got Stockholm, and we're looking uh, to move uh, that collaboration onward. So I'm going to identify some of the key findings and some of the key elements of this story. And there we go. Okay, so um, in, in, in sort of diametric contrast this morning to, to Ed, who put a chart up which was uh, uh, meaningful but uh, somewhat aesthetically displeasing, uh, I'm going to start with a chart that's kind of the precise reverse. This is, uh, I think, a beautiful chart. It looks like a, a Zaha Hadid painting, so I thought it would appeal to some of you in the audience. Um, but it's somewhat meaningless. It doesn't even have a y-axis. Um, but it tells a story. Effectively, these are a bunch of resources uh, that are being, you can see it's sort of disappearing into the background there, a bunch of resources uh, that are being consumed. And they are, that resource use is increasing pretty much exponentially. Um, and resource efficiency is going to be at the core of, of this story, and cities are going to be at the heart of, of that story. Cities very clearly are part of the problem. We know that. Uh, they are already home to half of the world's 7 billion population. By mid-century, that will rise to about three quarters. And even now, they account for about three quarters of the world's consumption and three quarters of the world's uh, emissions. And emissions can be used as a proxy for all sorts of uh, uh, resource uses. But as well as being part of the problem, cities are also very much part of the solution. Now, we know that cities, uh, by their very nature, were developed to take advantage of efficiencies. Cities are all about bringing people together and benefiting from the efficiencies that that brings, allowing goods, services to come in. Cities are usually established on rivers or on ports. Once those services are established, they can be distributed more easily to the present day. It's much easier to distribute electricity, uh, water, uh, take away waste, food, and so on. And it's, of course, a vibrant environment where you get people together. So, you have these, what I would call, static gains and efficiencies from bringing people together, which are precisely uh, the very reason that cities are developed in the first place. But also, and I think somewhat more importantly in the resource efficiency context, context cities uh, allow for these dynamic uh, efficiencies. What do I mean by that? Well, um, if we're going to have a chance of living within the world's resource envelope, we have to do what economists call uh, increase total factor productivity. We can't rely on reducing consumption and reducing output as a means uh, to reduce resource use. We have billions of people, in particular in the developing world, whose only route out of poverty is through economic growth and rising consumption. So the only way we're going to square the circle is to consume more, but to do so much more efficiently, and also maybe to change our tastes and preferences in terms of what and why we consume. Uh, and to do that, we have to change our mode of production. Production isn't just about what materials and inputs and people and capital you throw into the process. It's about, and this is what uh, total factor productivity stands for, it's about how smartly you use those materials, those people, those factories, those machines. Uh, it's about the technologies, it's about the processes, it's about the institutions. And cities play a, a, a central role in driving innovation that drives total factor pro productivity that will allow us to grow and live within our resource en envelope. And the reason is that they contain this unique blend, this, this heady cocktail of specialization and diversity when you get people together. And that provides a highly fertile environment for innovation in ideas, in technologies, and in processes. And that's why a lot of the innovations that we benefit from for the most part, tend to originate uh, in urban environments. So they are part of the problem, but cities are at the same time an important part of the solution. And innovation does not happen in a vacuum. Innovation happens because there is a challenge, there is a common understanding of the need to meet that challenge, and there is public support with clear lines of sight on how to uh, rise to that challenge. And that's when entrepreneurs and innovators really start getting fired up. Uh, cities 
are uh, essential for that process, but they also benefit from that process. So uh, you get innovation, but you also get, by uh, through your attempts to improve resource efficiency, you get, by definition, reduced waste, but you benefit also from reduced noise, reduced congestion, reduced pollution, lower health costs, and it's a very attractive city to the extent that this innovation is going on. You might get a business park, you might get a university. Uh, Bruce just talked about the importance of that, and you might end up with a much more livable city uh, as well as a prosperous and successful one. And it's why, if you look at cities across the world, you very often get cities at similar income levels, but with very divergent resource use. There are a number of uh, cities in North America whose uh, emissions of greenhouse gases, again a proxy for resource use more generally, are in the order of 20 to 30 tons per head. Um, there are cities in Europe, Barcelona, in fact most cities in Europe, Barcelona, though um, uh, Amsterdam, Helsinki, Stockholm, perhaps in key amongst these, Copenhagen, whose resource use in terms of uh, per capita emissions is of the order of five uh, or less in some cases. So we're talking substantial orders of magnitudes difference for similar levels of income. Now it's not clear that Copenhagen or Barcelona are less attractive cities to live in than, uh, for example, Phoenix or Atlanta. Um, so you can make very big difference, and I'm going to talk about how and why that happens. And part of that uh, depends on governance, and it depends on the relationship with cities and planning mechanisms. Um, affecting policy is often much easier to do at the urban level because citizens are much closer to their governments, both physically but actually also culturally. Uh, very often when you look at uh, surveys, they show that the urban population, we know that you know, these urbanites are kind of progressive and edgy, but they also put a higher premium on uh, sustainability, especially where there's a clearly understood uh, mandate. And I'm going to come back to some of the, the mindsets and psychologies that drive successful but also resource efficient cities. The other element that makes cities absolutely unique, the reason, if you like, perhaps the key reason why Nick Stern and others are so concerned about cities when it comes to living uh, resource efficiently, is that you can have the best climate policies in the world, you can have uh, globally coordinated agreements, but if you don't meaningfully do something about the urban form, you don't have a, a, a hope in hell of addressing the climate and resource use problem. And the main reason for that is because cities lock in behaviors, they lock in institutions, and they lock in physical infrastructures for a very long time, making it extremely expensive to reverse that process. Uh, you're also locking in, of course, emissions into the atmosphere. These sit around for decades, maybe hundreds of years. You're also depleting irreversible uh, resources in the process. And that infrastructure that you're locking into is not just physical, it's psychological. So um, what is it that, that demarcates, in a sense, uh, uh, cities like Stockholm and Copenhagen? Yes, they have great infrastructure, but they also have different mindsets that support the development of resource efficiency and reward it. Politicians are held accountable for sustainability sustainability, and they are rewarded. Um, let me give you an example, the one I, I like to use. You go to Copenhagen, and everybody cycles. Why does everybody cycle? Well, there's fantastic cycling infrastructure. Anyone who's been there will, will uh, attest to that. Why is there great infrastructure? Well, duh, it's because everybody cycles. Well, hang on a minute, there's a, there's a chicken and egg here. Well, there is, and that's the whole point about path dependency at the urban level. It doesn't matter what triggers a sustainable path. Once you're on it, both because of the physical infrastructure, but also because of the psychological mindsets. You tend to get stuck on it. Again, that explains why you get these two very distinct camps in terms of high and low resource efficiency cities. One of the tragedies, of course, is that um, high, uh, sorry, low resource efficiency cities are actually more expensive in the short run. They require upfront investment, they require careful planning. And that's why uh, a lot of the poorer countries in the world have the most wasteful cities. They can't afford the infrastructure that Stockholm and Copenhagen take for granted, and it costs them year by year by year, and it makes them much less resilient. So resource efficient cities are not just important for the planet, they're also important for their own competitiveness and their own development. Now this is a, a pretty graphic picture of someone who's not clearly not very happy uh, for reasons related to the state of that house. Uh, which was doubtless hers, and it comes from a study by uh, Carl Zenig called The Death of Sprawl, and it relates to a city close to Los Angeles, about 100 miles away, called Victorville. Uh, and the story of Victorville was that it was built during the housing boom in the US at a time when gas prices, uh, or petrol prices, to use English parlance, uh, were around $2 uh, per gallon. They doubled to $4 per gallon by 2008, and suddenly, Driving 100 miles or whatever to your nearest school or to 50 miles to your nearest school or your shopping center didn't look quite so attractive. So people didn't want to buy the houses. So the house prices collapsed. So the mortgages foreclosed. 
Uh, the mortgage companies couldn't even sell the houses, and in the end, they just demolished the whole lot. Brand new housing stock demolished. That development was rendered unviable, more or less, overnight, because it hadn't planned for a change in uh, resource prices. Well, if you like, that's a microcosm of what might happen as resource prices rise, as India and China uh, and other parts of the developing world continue to place demand uh, which outstrips supply, uh, as, uh, as a very, uh, Jeremy will tell us, this fantastic McKinsey report uh, recently uh, very clearly showed. And this isn't just sort of small beer, actually, it's that collapse in the US housing market that led to the, uh, uh, the, the credit default swap problem with subprime mortgages, which actually had ramifications which uh, we all know about since. So not planning your urban environment is a crucial uh, or, or planning your urban environment, I should say, to put it in, in, in a positive sense, is essential for the economic uh, sustainability as well as the environmental sustainability of your cities. Now, density is a clearly uh, a very important element here. I said that one of the reasons why we live in cities in the first place is because of the economies of scale that you get through dense urban environments, but it also tells you something about policies. Policies must be integrated. It, you can't just have a green roof here or a turbine there or combined heat and power somewhere else. If you supply uh, plug-in points for electric vehicles, but those vehicles plug into a coal-fired grid and uh, are in a city that is uh, sprawling and building highways so that they have to drive for long distances, um, that's not going to be an integrated policy that brings emissions down. So uh, one, of, one of the important elements of the policy story is that that policy must be integrated and coherent. The sum of policies is always greater than the parts. If you look at successful cities, there are always ones which have an integrated set of uh, environmental, social, uh, spatial, and planning policies. Um, some examples from Portland, uh, from, uh, from Copenhagen, indeed, uh, against the backdrop of the very beautiful uh, central station in Berlin, a number of uh, examples across leading cities. I'm not going to go through these. I, I hope that we're going to make these uh, charts available, uh, this presentation available at the end. Uh, there's an appendix as well which takes you through some of the city actions that have been undertaken. But suffice it to say, there are lots of them. They are happening across the world, not just in the developed world, and they are integrated. The successful city stories are all about integrated uh, environmental uh, sustainability and innovation uh, policies. Which brings me uh, to the question of smart cities. Well, it's, it's almost as the US founding fathers might have put it, self-evident that if a city is a system with inputs and outputs uh, and throughputs, uh, we know uh, that mostly food, raw materials, water comes in. We know that uh, products and waste tend to go out. And in the middle, we've got uh, we've got humans, then it is pretty clear that cities that think, that adapt, that evolve, that learn to optimize their use of resources, of energy, of healthcare, they communicate so as to provide optimal and efficient use of uh, education, social services, they connect not just things to things, but, but, but people, to, uh, sorry, not just people to people and things to things, as you might associate with a smart grid, say, but people to things, so that you get smart healthcare, smarter public safety and security. Um, and the internet and broadband and connectivity have to be a really important part of making those connections and improving the dynamism and efficiency uh, of cities. Uh, policy, uh, I've said already, has to be coordinated. But it's not just a case of building the infrastructure. A lot of it, by the way, is building the infrastructure, because I've said how important it is to lock into the right physical but also psychological infrastructure. But that's not enough. You have to keep the policy signals effective so that the private sector feels it has a stake in the game and can make money out of this if the entrepreneurs and if the innovators are to continue uh, to invest in sustainable cities and if public support is going to continue uh, to carry uh, that investment and push politicians to be held accountable for that investment. That means pricing the damages you do through some form of uh, pricing externalities such as carbon and other rare resources. It means uh, overcoming information barriers through providing standards and regulations. It means pushing certain technologies, but doing so in a way that is open, that is transparent, that defines outcomes rather than pick specific technologies. So you limit the possibility that policy, uh, that, that, that market failures are simply replaced by policy failures where vested interests lobby government hard in order to get a bigger slice of the cake. So I'm going to end with this sort of rather lovely sunset view of, uh, uh, of solar panels over London uh, and just say effectively that you know, the story of cities and what makes the story of the economics of cities so important 
both to the story relating to environmental sustainability the world over and the ability of the planet to win, live within its uh, resource envelope, but also to the individual sustainability and competitiveness of cities in an environment where resource costs can only go up in the long term. We've seen 100 years of falling resource prices wiped out in the space of a decade as Asia industrializes and competes for the same resources we're competing. And that's happening at a time, by the way, when a third of the world is more or less in recession. So that's quite extraordinary. So if you want your cities to be resilient and successful, as well as innovative and dynamic, um, sustainability has to be part of your economic as well as your environmental strategy. The choices that we make today at the city level, on transport, on infrastructure, on buildings, on industry, will have echoes and ramifications for decades to come. Uh, people in London wear Mind the Gap t-shirts. Why? Because the central line curves at Bank Station. Because the Romans designed the streets that way 2,000 years ago. That echo uh, still rings true today. Uh, how we make those choices will determine the technology, the institutions, and the behaviors we lock into. And ultimately, cities and those choices that are made will determine whether mankind can both manage climate change and capture the benefits of resource-efficient growth. Thank you very much.